So one way to think about revolutions, think about what a revolution is. It's a project to change everything, right? So often we think of politics as something that happens up there, right? Political parties, they're involved in debates, we watch the news, we get involved. If we're interested, we don't get involved. People complain about apathy these days, that no one is involved enough in, in politics. Perhaps what's going on in the world right now with Trump and so on is a reaction to that, and all these kinds of questions, right? If you think of revolution as a political form, one of the thing that it, things that it doesn't allow for is apathy. And the reason for that is because revolution, if you like, is a very peculiarly modern political form. Some people talk of revolution as the kind of myth of modernity, the birth of modernity as we know it. So that's why we always talk about 1789, the French Revolution, as somehow the beginning of the modern world, right? It's a peculiarly totalizing project. It's a project that embraces everything within its scope, right? It's a project that tries politically to change everything, not just politics, but the world in which people live. The very people that live in that world have to be transformed, right? Now, I work in Cuba. I've been working there for 20 years as an anthropologist. And one of the most interesting things that I found in my research, even though originally I went there to study actually Afro-Cuban religions, right? I didn't go there because Cuba had been involved in a revolutionary uh, transformation, right? But what struck me most uh, since the, light, uh, the late 1990s when I've been working there is the way in which revolution is something that penetrates the whole of society and changes every nook and cranny of people's lives, right? There's no way of escaping, if you like, the political form that is revolution if you live in a society that has been thoroughly transformed by it, as has been the case in Cuba, right? So as an anthropologist who studies cultural and social phenomena, right? I'm not a political scientist, I'm an anthropologist. I find that it's particularly interesting to study revolution as a social cultural form, right? And the way that revolution has this capacity to transform the coordinates of society and culture for people, right? So let me give you a few examples of how that works uh, in Cuba, right? One of the key things that happened in Cuba, and that's one of the things that Che Guevara is most famous for, is a very, very concerted attempt throughout the 1960s after the revolution in 1959, where Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, uh, Camilo Cienfuegos, and other revolutionary leaders took over the power from Fulgencio Batista, who was the dictator who ran the country before, right? was a project of educational transformation of the whole country. So one of the things that the Cuban Revolution was most famous for was its literacy campaigns in the early 60s, right? Where young people from the urban centers were sent out to the furthest reaches of the territory to teach people how to read, right? And one of the reasons why that was so important for Cubans, for the Cuban leadership of the revolution, was that they saw the project of revolution as a project of the transformation of consciousness. So Che Guevara talked about conciencia in, in Spanish, consciousness, as the target of revolutionary transformation in order to produce what he saw uh, as the possibility of creating a new man, el hombre nuevo. And the new man would be this altruistic person, a person who didn't work for self-interest, but worked for, for, for the sake of the social whole, right? And this involved a kind of massive project of re-education of the population, right? Now, one of the interesting effects of this is that Cuban people are, in a sense, exposed to a massive, forceful, in many ways, project of transformation by the new power of the government, right? And they feel that this kind of um, all-encompassing political project reaches into the very soul of the person, right? So in some ways, you've got a very interesting situation in Cuba in the 1960s and 70s where you have a government that is very officially skeptical about religious phenomena, right? So this was an atheist revolution, right? These were people who closed down the seminaries, they were not interested in Catholicism, they were very suspicious of the kinds of things that I went to Cuba to study, Afro-Cuban religions, rituals, these are the religions that the uh, slaves who were working in the plantations in the 19th century brought from West Africa and Central Africa to Cuba, right? And these are very, very strong in Cuba today and were strong in the 1950s and 60s. Fidel Castro and his associates wanted to eliminate this, right? But in doing this, they created, if you like, a project that could be seen as an alternative religious project. Because in an analogical sense, this project of personal moral transformation had a very, very strong, if you like, almost Christian sonority to it, right? So Cuban people were called upon 
to change the way they think, the way they feel, the way they respond, and to become more virtuous, right? Now, virtue is, in some ways, traditionally, the remit of the church, of religion. So this is, in a sense, a state that takes on the role, or the traditional role, of the church in changing, in changing people's conceptions of who they are, how they should act, and so on, right? Now, one of the reasons why this is really interesting is because it was, in many ways, unsuccessful, right? So let me tell you the story of one of the priests of this Afro-Cuban religion that I specialize in in my own studies, which is called Ifa. Now, Ifa is an, a kind of oracular tradition, a tradition of divination, right? A tradition of very prestigious initiated priests, right? Uh, of this um, religion that today is associated with Nigeria and particularly with Yoruba speak speaking people in Nigeria. People who came from that part of Africa to Cuba in the 19th century brought this practice with them. And today, in the kind of post-Soviet era of the Cuban Revolution, these practices have become very strong once again, right? Now, one priest uh, in this uh, religion who is particularly prominent, who's called Victor uh, in Havana, who I've worked with a lot and a lot of anth other anthropologists know too because he's so prominent, once uh, when we were t sitting together drinking coffee and maybe with a little bit of rum too, began to tell me how important he personally, as well as his colleagues in the religion of Ifa, were for the sustainment of the, or the sustenance, if you like, of the Cuban Revolution. We were talking, this was, must have been in 2005 or something like that. And he was saying, Martin, without us, this revolution would have collapsed long ago. And the reason for this is that we, par excellence, are the experts in attracting power to the island. Now, in this Afro-Cuban religion, you have this concept of Ache. Ache can be translated possibly as power, right? Uh, or as life, uh, life principle, like what gives life to things, right? So I have Ache, you have Ache, an animal has Ache, a ritual might have Ache, gods have different kinds of Ache, right? And one of the ways to attract Ache, to bring power and to charge things with power, is to do animal sacrifices, right? So by feeding the gods with the animals that they like eating, and particularly with the blood of those animals, you are empowering those gods, and those gods therefore can protect you, right? So what Victor was saying is that because of the sacrifices of animals that he was performing, uh, and that all of these priests perform in Cuba regularly, right? They were feeding the island with the power of Ache, right? And this makes the island powerful and therefore possible to, to sustain the revolutionary project. So I find really interesting in this context a revolutionary project that, if you like, asks of its people a form of asceticism, a form of self-sacrifice, a form of personal transformation that is very, very Christian and is self-sacrificial in many ways. Change yourself to become a better person. Sacrifice some of your desires for the sake of the revolution. And then some of the people who live within this project, these Afro-Cuban priests, who are thinking of sacrifice in a rather different way, right? Sacrifice of animals to attract power, which, by the way, makes the revolution more powerful, right? So you've got these different cultural conceptions to do with sacrifice and revolution and how these things are related, which make the Cuban revolution today an extremely vibrant uh, topic to be studying as an anthropologist, right? So that, if you like, in a way, is, is a way of thinking as an anthropologist of the Cuban Revolution um, that thinks of it more in terms of religion, cosmology, ritual, and so on, right? Which are the kinds of things that anthropologists very often talk about, right? Um, but there's other ways to think of the Cuban Revolution as a kind of cultural phenomenon, if you like, or a socio-cultural phenomenon, right? And here I want to tell the story of a, a different character, not Victor anymore, but Clarita, who's a, another person that I've known for a number of years in, in Cuba, who is a very normal lady. Um, she's in her mid-40s. She has uh, worked for a very long time in a construction company. More, recent, she's, more recently, she's been working uh, in, a kind of, uh, in the tourist industry, right? And she is a person who's in her 40s, so she was born in the process of the revolution, right? So she was born in the, in the 70s. Uh, and she's never known anything different. She's always lived within this thing that the Cubans call La Revolución, this thing that captures everything inside it, right? And she's not very political herself. Um, she just lives her life, right? But she told me once the story, I met her in the morning and she was a little bit frustrated when we met. 
and she said to me, oh, you know, I'm so fed up, you know, I took this taxi to come here. In Cuba, you have these communal taxis where basically you have six, six people in the same cab d going in different places. It's a bit like a taxi bus. So you meet people in the taxi. And there was this person in the taxi, apparently, who was complaining and complaining and complaining about politics and about the government and about all the problems and the poverty and the difficulties. And he wanted to travel and he wanted to leave and go and live in Miami and so on. So she just got fed up with him and listening to all his problems. And she said to him inside the taxi, uh, listen, ma'am, if you're so exhausted and so frustrated with this uh, situation, why don't you just leave the country? Why don't you just make yourself a boat or find a boat and travel to Florida, which is what a lot of Cuban people do. They leave Cuba in the middle of the night and go and migrate to the United States, right? Leave here, you know? And then she turned to me as she was telling me this story, and she says, because you know what, Martin? I'm a revolutionary. In my own way, I am a revolutionary. Why? Because I've been formed in this revolution. And that to me was a very interesting statement. What does it mean for someone who is not particularly political, she wasn't a member of the party, she wasn't a communist, uh, but nevertheless she found that it was important for her to say to me that in her own way she is a revolutionary and to explain that by saying that she has been formed by the revolution. Right? Now, if you go into the life story of this woman a little bit more, I think you begin to get a better sense of what that might mean. Right? Now, I mentioned earlier on the significance that people like Che Guevara attached to the revolutionary transformation of people as a project of the transformation of their consciousness through education, right? This idea that you will create revolutionary people, these new people, through changing the way that they think effectively, right? Now that project didn't work at all in the case of this woman, and she was quite normal in that sense, right? But what did work is the way in which the revolution as a state political project penetrated her very life in a much more material way, not in the way that she thinks, but in the way that she is able to live, if you like, right? And what I mean by this is the way that this woman lived, in particular in relation to her house and in relation to her food, right? The most basic things, right? So in relation to food, this goes for all of Cuba, right? Throughout the revolution, you have had this system of, of rationing, right? Where the government, in a very sophisticated system of partitioning goods, effectively feeds the population, right? So every Cuban citizen has the right every month to eat a certain amount of food, which they get in an extremely subsidized price from the government, right? So in a very literal sense, this woman has been formed by the revolution because she's been fed by the revolution, right? So every month she goes to the state dispensary and is fed by the state, right? And that's how people see it. They see this food as arriving pertaining to them from the state. So they have this very direct relationship with the state through this alimentary relationship, right? But that's kind of obvious. Even more interesting for me is the way in which the revolution is constructed through infrastructure, right? So in a state revolutionary society such as the Cuban, and the same could be said about the Soviet Union or about many countries in Eastern Europe or about um, Mozambique or Angola or many socialist countries across the world, the state takes on this paternalistic, if you like, responsibility of housing the population, right? Now what's interesting about this woman, Clarita, is that she worked in a construction company for a great part of her life, right? And part of her being working in this construction company gave her the right to build her own house through state resources. This was a project that lasted for about eight or nine years, right? And a very complicated process that involved Clarita in a very complex web of relationships with state officials, with state materials, with state logistics companies who had to bring cement to the neighborhood, who had to bring bricks to the neighborhood, who had to bring the workmen. She herself with her mother had to feed these workmen, so she established relationships with them because she was feeding them and so on, right? So the state project of revolution, understood as a project of infrastructure, became a personal project for her, right? And what she ended up with in this case, to cut a very long story short, was the house that she's living in today. Every brick in that house, every bit of cement, connects that woman internally with a state project of revolution, right? So you have this intimate daily relationship between a woman and the revolutionary project, which begins to give you a sense in which revolution is not just a political thing that people do up there, but a personal thing that feeds you, that houses you, etc. So to sum up, what you could say is that because precisely of its all-embracing quality,
the Cuban Revolution specifically, but perhaps we could say the same for revolutions in different parts of the world, right, manages to penetrate very deeply into people's lives in a way that other political forms perhaps don't always manage to do, right? So it doesn't respect these distinctions, if you like, between the private and the public, right? It becomes a very personal project. And that is very interesting because on the one hand, you can see the revolution as a project of penetrating into people's lives. But, but if you like, in a kind of reciprocal movement, you can see the ways in which the way that people live their lives transform the nature of the political project, as we saw in the, in the example with religion, where you saw these Afro-Cuban priests imagining themselves as transforming the nature of the project. So it's actually very interesting to see, if you tra start treating revolutionary politics as a cultural and social form, to see the interrelationship, if you like, the interpenetration between politics and culture and society, and how they mutually transform each other in the deepest sense possible.